Welcome back, boys and girls. This is Holes, chapter six through 10. Stanley took a shower, if you could call it that, ate dinner, if you could call it that, went to bed, if you could call his smelly, scratchy cot a bed. Because of the scarcity of water, each camper was only allowed a four minute shower. It took Stanley nearly that long to get used to the cold water. There was no knob for hot water. He kept stepping into, then jumping back from and the spray until the water shut off automatically. He never managed to use his bar of soap, which was just as well because he wouldn't have had time to rinse off the suds. Dinner was some kind of stewed meat and vegetables. The meat was brown and the vegetables had once been green. Everything tasted pretty much the same. He ate it all and used his slice of white bread to mop up the juice. Stanley had never been to one to leave food on his plate, no matter how it tasted. What'd you do? One of the campers asked him. At first, Stanley didn't know what he meant. They sent you here for a reason. Oh, he realized, I, uh, I stole a pair of sneakers. The other boys thought this was funny. Stanley wasn't sure why. Maybe because their crimes were a lot worse than stealing shoes. From a store or were they on someone's feet? Asked Squid. Uh, neither, Stanley answered. They belong to Clyde Livingston. Nobody believed him. Sweet feet, said X-Ray. You're right. No way, said Squid. Now, as Stanley lay on his cot, he thought it was kind of funny in a way. Nobody had believed him when he said he was innocent. And now when he said he stole them, nobody believed him either. Clyde Sweet Feet Livingston was a famous baseball player. He had led the American lead in stolen bases over the last three years. He was also the only player in history to ever hit four triples in one game. Stanley had a poster of him hanging on, on his bedroom. He used to have the poster anyway. He didn't know where it was now. It had been taken by the police and was used as evidence of his guilt in the courtroom. Clyde Livingston also came to court. In spite of everything, when Stanley found out that Sweet Feet was going to be there, he was actually excited about the prospect of meeting his hero. Clyde Livingston testified that they were his sneakers and that he had donated them to help raise money for a homeless shelter. He said he couldn't imagine what kind of horrible person would steal from homeless children. That was the worst part for Stanley. His hero thought he was a no good, dirty, rotten thief. As Stanley tried to turn over on his cot, he was afraid it was going to collapse under all of his weight. He barely fit in it. And when he managed to roll over on his stomach, the smell was so bad that he had to turn over again and try sleeping on his back. The cot smelled like sour milk. Though it was night, the air was still very warm. Armpit was snoring two cots away. Back at school, a bully named Derek Dunn was used to torment, used to torment Stanley. The teachers never took Stanley's complete ser complaint seriously because Derek was so much smaller than Stanley. Some teachers even seemed to find it amusing that a little kid like Derek could pick on someone as big as Stanley. On the day that Stanley was arrested, Derek had taken Stanley's notebook and after a long game of come and get it, finally dropped it in the toilet in the boys' restroom. By the time Stanley retrieved it, he had missed his bus and went had to walk home. It was a while that he was walking home, carrying his wet notebook with the prospect of having to copy the ruined pages and the sneakers that fell from the sky. I was walking home and the sneakers fell from the sky, he had told the judge. One hit me on the head. It had hurt too. They hadn't exactly fallen from the sky. He had just walked out from under a freeway overpass and the shoe hit him on the head. Stanley took it as some kind of sign. His father had been trying to figure out a way to recycle old sneakers and suddenly, pair of sneakers 
fell on top of him, seemingly out of nowhere, like a gift from God. Naturally, he had no way of knowing they belonged to Clyde Livingston. In fact, the shoes were anything but sweet. Whoever had worn them had a bad case of foot odor. Stanley couldn't help but think that there was something special about the shoes. They would somehow provide the key to his father's invention. It was too much of a coincidence to be a mere accident. Now, one thing we can do is to look up words as we go. And certain words, if you highlight them with this tool, you can look up the dictionary. Now, coincidence is a remarkable occurrence of events or circumstances that seem to have some sort of cause an effect relationship. One leads to other, other. They're basically linked. So it was too much of a coincidence to be an accident. Stanley felt like he was holding destiny's shoes. He ran. Thinking back now, he wasn't sure why he ran. Maybe he was in a hurry to bring the shoes to his father, or maybe he was trying to run away from his miserable and humiliating day at school. A patrol car pulled along beside him. The policeman asked him why he was running. Then he took the shoes and made a call on his radio. And shortly thereafter, Stanley was arrested. It turned out that the sneakers had been stolen from a display at the homeless shelter. That evening, rich people were going to come to the shelter and pay $100 to eat the food that the poor people ate every day for free. Clyde Livingston, who had once lived at the shelter when he was younger, was going to speak and sign autographs. His shoes would be auctioned. Now, if you don't know what that is, take a look. There's a public sale and they're able to bid on items. So someone might say this is $10. Someone says I'll take it for $15. Someone might say it's $50, which is higher, and it might be sold to the highest bidder. And it was expected that they would sell for over $5,000. All that money would then go to help the homeless. Because of the baseball schedule, Stanley's trial was delayed for several months. His parents couldn't afford a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer, his mother said, had said. Just tell the truth. Stanley told the truth, but perhaps it had been better if he had lied a little. He could have said he found the shoes in the street. No one believed they fell from the sky. Now, an overpass, if you're not familiar with, is think of it as a, a road passes this way, but there is a higher road that goes above it, and it's usually um, where you know cars pass on top and then cars pass on the bottom. So as he is walking underneath from the overpass, suddenly shoes kind of fall from the sky. So I want you to kind of imagine what would make shoes kind of fall from the sky in that way. But all of a sudden these shoes inexplicably, which means with no reason at all, seem to fall from the sky. Not a very believable story, but what had happened? Stanley had told the truth, but perhaps it would have been a little better if he had lied a little. He could have said he found the shoes in the street. No one believed that they fell from the sky. It wasn't destiny, he realized. It was his. No good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. The curse. The judge called Stanley's crime despicable. That's a great word. Deserving hatred or contempt to really hate someone. The shoes were valued at over $5,000. It was money that would provide food and shelter for the homeless. And you stole that from them just so you can have a souvenir. And you know what a souvenir is? You take home something that's a reminder. The judge said that there was an opening at Cam Greenblake, and he suggested that the discipline of the camp might improve Stanley's character. It was either that or jail. Stanley's parents asked if they could have some time to find out more about Camp Greenlake, but the judge advised them to make a quick decision. Vacancies don't last long at Camp Greenlake. A vacancy is an open spot. Chapter 7. The shovel felt heavy in Stanley's soft, fleshy hands. He tried to jam it into the earth, but the blade banged against the ground and bounced off without making a dent. 
The vibrations ran up the shaft of the shovel and into Stanley's wrist, making his bones rattle. It was still dark. The only light that came from the moon and the stars and more stars than Stanley had ever seen before, it seemed he had only just gotten to sleep when Mr. Pandansky came in and woke everyone up. Remember, he said wake up was 4.30 in the morning. Using all his might, he brought the shovel back onto the dry lead bay, lake bed. The force stung his hands but made no impression on the earth. He wondered if he had a defective shovel. He glanced at Zero, about 15 feet away, who had scooped out a shovel full of dirt and dumped it on a pile and was already almost a foot tall. For breakfast, they had been served some kind of lukewarm cereal. The best part was the orange juice. They each got a pint carton and the cereal actually didn't taste too bad, but it had smelled just like his cot. They filled their canteens, those were their water jugs, got their shovels and were marched out across the lake. Each group was assigned a different area. The shovels were kept in a shed near the showers. They all looked the same to Stanley, although X-Ray had his own special shovel, which no one else was allowed to use. X-Ray claimed it was shorter than the others. And if it was only by a fraction of an inch, remember they're allowed to dig their holes a certain amount wide and deep, and the um, cord of the shovel helps them measure that. The shovels were five feet long from the tip of the steel blade to the end of the wooden shaft. Stanley's hole would have to be as deep as his shovel, and he'd have to be able to lay the shovel flat across the bottom in any direction. That's why X-Ray wanted the shortest shovel. The lake was so full of holes and mounds that it reminded Stanley of pictures he'd seen of the moon like craters. If you find anything interesting or unusual, Mr. Pandansky had told him, you should report it to me or Mr. Sir when we come around with the water truck. If the warden likes what you found, you'll get the rest of the day off. What are we supposed to be looking for? Stanley asked. You're not looking for anything. You're digging to build character. It's just if you find anything, the and would like to know about it. He glanced helplessly at a shovel. It wasn't effective. He was defective. He noticed a thin crack in the ground. He pointed the, placed the point of his shovel on top of it, then jumped on the back of the blade with both feet. The shovel sank a few inches into the packed earth. He smiled for once in his life. It paid to be overweight. He leaned on the shaft and pried up his first shovel full of dirt, then dumped it on the side. Only 10 million more to go, he thought. Then placed the shovel back in the crack and jumped on it again. He unearthed several shovelfuls of dirt in this manner before it occurred to him that he was dumping his dirt within the perimeter of his hole. Five feet would be, was awfully wide. He'd moved the dirt he'd already dug up out past his mark. He took a drink from his canteen. Five feet would also be awfully deep too. The digging got easier after a while. The ground was hardest at the surface where the sun had baked it, a crust about eight inches deep. Good metaphor there, not really a crust, but think of kind of like a pie crust, okay, there and got much harder, um, that porch portion there. Beneath that, the earth was looser, but the time by, by the time Stanley broke past the crust, a blister had formed in the middle of his right thumb and it hurt to hold the shovel. If you've ever done yard work without gloves or a lot of shoveling for some reason, the, when you, the friction between your hand and a shovel or any sort of tool like that rubbing over and over again. Think of it like getting a blister on your foot when you wear a new pair of shoes. It eventually causes a blister which is like a sore, but you have to also still um, shovel through or walk with that blister. It could be very painful. Stanley's great great grandfather was named Elia Yelnats. He was born in Latvia and when he was 15 years old, he fell in love with Mira Menke. What you'll notice about holes is that the time period will jump back and forth. 
And this novel uses the idea of flashbacks. They flashbacks to part of the past. So you find out about Stanley's story in little bits and pieces over time. So that's one storyline to um, keep thinking about, which is why Stanley's there and what happened. So Stanley's storyline. And then there's other storylines that flash back into the past and um, talk about Stanley's family, as well as other storylines. So when there are jumps in the story, as, as we read along the story, and I hope you're hooked, it's a great book, um, just be aware that there's going to be a lot of jumping back and forth in time. And a lot of times when he is outside and he is digging, that's a time where I believe it kind of almost seems like his mind is wandering and we take a break from that present and go into the past. And it's usually related to someone in his family. He was born in Latvia and when he was 15 years old, he fell in love with Mira Menke. He didn't know that he was Stanley's great, great grandfather. Mira Menke was 14. She would turn 15 in two months at which time her father had decided that she should be married. Ella went to the, her father to ask her for her hand, but so, do, so did Igor Barkov, a pig farmer. Igor was 57 years old and he had a red nose and fat puffy cheeks. I'll trade you my fattest pig for your daughter, Igor offered. And what have you got, Myra's father? asked Elia. A heart full of love. He truly loved her. Hmm. Now at this time, marriage was a bit different and sometimes they would trade different things in order to uh, approve of a marriage. Father thinks about this and he said, I'd rather have a fat pig, said Myra's father. Desperate, uh, Elia. Now he loves this woman and wants to marry her very badly, but doesn't have much of a fortune or much of anything to offer um, for the daughter. Desperate, Isla went to see Madame Zomrumi. She was an old Egyptian woman who lived on the edge of town. He had become friends with her, though she was quite a bit older than him. She was even older than Igor Barkov. Madame Zomrumi had dark skin and a very wide mouth. When she looked at you, her eyes seemed to expand and you felt like she was looking right through you. Elia, what's wrong? She asked before he had even told her he was upset. She was sitting in a homemade wheelchair. She had no left foot. Her leg stopped at her ankle. I'm in love with Mira Menke, Elia confessed, but Igor Borkov has offered to trade his fattest pig for her. I can't compete with that. Good, said Madame Zaroni. You're too young to get married. You've got your whole life ahead of you. But I love Myra. Myra's head is as empty as a flower pot. But she's beautiful. So is a flower pot. Can she push a plow? Can she milk a goat? No. She's too delicate. Can she have an intelligent conversation? No, she is silly and foolish. Will she take care of you when you are sick? No, she is spoiled and will only want you to take care of her. So she is beautiful. So what? Pooh. Madame Zeroni spat on the dirt. She told Elia that he should go to America. Like my son, that's where your fortune lies, not with Mira Minky. But Elia would hear none of that. He was 15 and all he could see was Mira's shallow beauty. So shallow means just like a shallow bowl or there's not much depth to it. But when you're only looking um, at somebody's outward appearance, it's considered a bit shallow. Madame Zaroni hated to see Elia so forlorn. Against her better judgment, she agreed to help him. It just so happens that my sow, which means like a pig, gave birth to a litter of piglets yesterday, she said. There's one little runt whom she won't suckle. You may have him. He would die anyway. Madame Cerrone led Elia around the back of her house where she keeps her pigs. Elia took the tiny piglet, but he didn't see what good it would do him. It wasn't much bigger than a rat. He'll grow, Madame Zeroni assured. 
Do you see that mountain on the edge of the forest? Yes, said Alia. On the top of the mountain, there is a stream where the water runs uphill. You must carry the piglet every day to the top of the mountain and let it drink from the stream. As it drinks, you are to sing to him. She taught Elia a special song to sing to the pig. Hmm. On the day of Mira's 15th birthday, you should carry the pig up the mountain for the last time. Then take it directly to Mira's father. It will be fatter than any of Igor's pigs. If it's that big and fat, asked Alia, how will I be able to carry it up the mountain? The piglet is not too heavy for you now, is it? Asked Madame Zaroni. Of course not, said Elia. Do you think it will be too heavy for you tomorrow? No. Well, every day you will carry the pig up the mountain. It will get a little bigger, but you will get a little stronger. And after you give the pig to Mira's father, I want you to do one more thing for me. Anything, said Ayla. I want you to carry me up the mountain. I want to drink from the stream and I want you to sing me, sing the song to me. Elia promised he would. Madame Zaroni warned that if he failed to do this, he and his descendants, hmm, where have we heard that word descendants before? meaning someone in your ancestral line. So people who are born after you uh, in that case. Descendants would be doomed for all eternity. Hmm, think about that. At the time, Elia knew nothing of the curse. He was just a 15 year old kid and eternity didn't seem much longer than a week from Tuesday. Besides, he liked Madame Zeroni and he would be glad to carry her up the mountain. He would have done it right then and there, but he wasn't yet strong enough. Now, back to Stanley. When the time lapses happen, I want you to think about when and why and the bits and pieces, because you have to kind of take into account several storylines. And this novel will sprinkle bits of the storylines like breadcrumbs. So try to keep them kind of all together. Stanley was digging, still digging. His hole was about three feet deep, but only in the center. It sloped upward to the edges. The sun had only just come up over the horizon, but he could already feel its hot rays against his face. As he reached down to pick up his canteen, he felt a sudden rush of dizziness and put his hands on his knees to steady himself. For a moment, he was afraid he would throw up, but the moment passed. He drank the last drop of water for his can from his canteen. He had blisters on every one of his fingers and one in the center of each palm. Everyone else's hole was a lot deeper than his. He couldn't actually see their holes, but he could tell by the size of their dirt piles. So think of it as a bunch of holes that you might kind of see in the book cover. And beneath, with each one, there is a hole here, but a dirt pile of all of the dirt that was inside there once. He saw a cloud of dust moving across the wasteland and noticed that the other boys had stopped digging and were watching it too dirt cloud moved closer and he could see that it trailed behind a red pickup truck. The truck stopped near where he was digging and the boys lined up behind it, x-ray in front, zero at the rear, Stanley got in line behind zero. Mr. Sir filled each of their canteens from a tank of water in the bed of the pickup. That means the back. As he took Stanley's canteen from him, he said, this isn't Girl Scouts, is it? Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. Mr. Sir followed Stanley back to his hole to see how he was doing. You better get with it, he said, or else you're gonna be digging in the hottest part of the day. He popped some sunflower seeds in his mouth, deftly removed the shells with his teeth and spat them into Stanley's hole. Every day, now we're back to Elia's story. 
Every day, Elia carried the little piglet up the mountain and sang to it as it drank from the stream. And as the pig grew fatter, Elia grew stronger. And on the day of Mira's 15th birthday, Elia's pig weighed over 50 stones. Madame Zaroni had told him to carry the pig up the mountain on that day as well. But Elia didn't want to present himself to Mira smelling like a pig. Instead, he took a bath. It was his second bath in less than a week. And then he led the pig to Myra's. Igor Barkov was there with his pig as well. These are two of the finest pigs I have ever seen, Myra's father declared. He was also impressed with Elia, who seemed to have grown bigger and stronger in the last two months. I used to think you were a good-for-nothing book reader, he said, but now I see you could be an excellent mud wrestler. May I marry your daughter? Elia boldly asked. First, I must weigh the pigs. Alas, poor Elia should have carried his pig up the mountain one last time. The two pigs weighed exactly the same. Back to Stanley. Stanley's blisters had ripped open and new blisters formed. He kept changing his grip on the shovel to try to avoid the pain. So he's trying to kind of work around not actually uh, having the sores hit the shovel, which is really impossible to do. Finally, he removed his cap and held it between the shovel the shaft of the shovel, the wooden part, and his raw hands. This helped, but digging was harder because the cap would slip and slide, and the sun beat down on his unprotected head now and neck. Though he tried to convince himself otherwise, he had been aware for a while that his piles of dirt were too close to his hole. The piles were outside his five-foot circle, but he could see that he was going to run in a room. And still he pretended otherwise and kept adding more dirt to the piles, piles he would eventually have to then move. The problem was that when the dirt was in the ground, it was compacted. Okay, so compacted means like really tight. It was expanded when it excavated. That's a great word. The piles were a lot bigger than his hole was deep. It was either now or later. Reluctantly, he climbed up out of his hole and once again dug his shovel into the previously dug dirt. Oh. Back to the story. Myra's father got down on his hands and knees and closely examined each pig tail to snout. Those are two of the finest pigs I have ever seen, he said at last. How am I to decide? I have only one daughter. Well, why not let Myra decide, suggested Iga, Elia. That's preposterous, exclaimed Igor, expelling saliva as he spoke. Myra's just an empty-headed girl, said her father. How can she possibly decide when I, her father, can't? She knows how she feels in her heart, said Elia. Myra's father rubbed his chin. Then he laughed and said, why not? He slapped Elia on the back. It doesn't matter to me, a pig is a pig. He summoned his daughter. Elia blushed when Myra entered the room. Good, more, good afternoon, Myra, he said. She looked at him. You're Elia, right? She asked. Myra, said her father. Elia and Igor, each have offered a pig for your hand in marriage. It doesn't matter to me, a pig is a pig. So I will let you make the choice. Whom do you wish to marry? Myra looked confused. You want me to decide? That's right, my blossom, said her father. Gee, I don't know. Which, which pig weighs more? They both weigh the same, said her father. Golly, said Myra, I guess I choose Elia. No, Igor. No, Elia. No, Igor. Oh, I don't know. I think... I think I'll just a number between one and 10. I'll marry whoever guesses the closest number. Okay, I'm ready. 10, guessed Igor. Elia said nothing. Elia, said Myra, what number do you guess? Elia didn't pick a number. Marry Igor, he muttered. You can keep my pig as a wedding present. 
Now, can you imagine if given the choice, he just assumed that she would pick him right away and all the trouble he went to to get the pig and she left it down to a numbers game and a guessing contest. The next time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr. Pandansky, who also brought sack lunches. Stanley sat with his back against a pile of dirt and ate. He had a bologna sandwich, potato chips, and a large chocolate chip cookie. How you doing? asked Magnet. Not real good, said Stanley. Well, the first hole's the hardest, Magnet said. Stanley took a long, deep breath. He couldn't afford to dawdle. He was way behind the others, and the sun kept getting hotter. It wasn't even noon yet, but he didn't know if he had the strength to stand up. He thought about quitting. He wondered what they would do to him. What could they do to him? His clothes were soaked with sweat. In school, he had learned that sweating was good for you. It's nature's way of keeping you cool. So why was he so hot? Using his shovel for support, he managed to get his feet, get to his feet. Where are we supposed to go to the bathroom? He asked Magnet. Magnet gestured with his arms to the great expanse around them. Pick a hole, any hole. Stanley staggered across the lake, almost falling over a dirt pile. Behind him, he heard Magnet say, but first, make sure nothing's living in it. After leaving Myra's house, Elia wandered aimlessly through the town until he found himself by the wharf. He sat down. That's a good point, too. So it's kind of like an area where a ship might kind of dock or unload. He sat down the edge of a pier and stared down into the cold black water. He could not understand how Myra had trouble deciding between him and Igor. He thought she loved him. Even if she didn't love him, couldn't she see what a foul person Igor was? It was like Madame Zaroni had said, her head was as empty as a flower pot. Good figurative language. Some men were gathering on another dock and he went to see what was going on and a sign read, deck hands wanted free passage to America. Deckhands would mean there'd be a helper on a ship. Remember, Madame Zeroni did say you should go to America, like her son. He had no sailing experience, but the ship's captain signed him aboard. The captain could see that Elia was a man of great strength. Not everyone could carry a full-grown pig up the side of a mountain. It wasn't until the ship cleared the harbor and was heading out across the Atlantic that he suddenly remembered his promise to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. He felt terrible. He wasn't afraid of the curse. He thought that was a lot of nonsense. He felt bad because he knew Madame Zeroni had wanted to drink from the stream before she died. Back to the story. Zero was the smallest kid in Group D, but he was the first one to finish digging. You're finished? Stanley asked enviously. So when you envy something, you really want what someone else has? Zero said nothing. Stanley walked to Zero's hole and watched him measure it with his shovel. The top of his hole was a perfect circle and the sides were smooth and steep and not one dirt clod more than necessary had been removed from the earth. Zero pulled himself up to the surface. He didn't even smile. He looked down in his perfectly dug hole, spat in it, and turned and headed back to the camp, camp, the camp compound. Zero's one weird dude, said Zigzag. Stanley would have laughed, but he didn't have the strength. Zigzag had to be the weirdest dude that Stanley had ever seen. He had a long skinny neck and a big round head with wild, frizzy blonde hair that stuck out in all directions. His head seemed to bob up and down on his neck like it was on a spring. That always makes me think of Tigger. Armpit was the second one to finish digging. He also spat into his hole before heading back to the camp, camp, the camp compound. And one by one, Stanley watched each of the boys spit into the hole and return to the camp compound. The compound's kind of the main area. Stanley kept digging. His hole was almost up to his shoulders, although it was hard to tell exactly where ground level was because his dirt piles completely surrounded the hole. The deeper he got, the harder it was to raise the dirt up and out of the hole. And once again, he realized he was going to have to move the piles. His cap was stained with blood from his hands and he felt like he was digging his own 
free. Back to the other story. In America, Elia learned to speak English. He fell in love with a woman named Sarah Miller. He could push, she could push a plow, milk a goat, and most important, think for herself. Hmm, sounds like someone or the type of person Madame Zeroni would approve of. She and Elia often stayed up half the night talking and laughing together. Their life was not easy. Elia worked hard, but bad luck seemed to follow him everywhere. He always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sound familiar? He remembered Madame Zeroni telling him that she had a son in America. Elia was for ever looking for him. He'd walk up to complete strangers and ask if they knew someone named Zeroni, or if he had ever heard of anyone named Zeroni. No one did. Elia wasn't sure what he would do if he ever found Madame Zeroni's son anyway. Carry him up a mountain and sing a pig lullaby to him? After his barn was struck by lightning for the third time, that's terrible luck, right? He told Sarah about his broken promise to Madame Zeroni. I'm worse than a pig thief, he said. You should leave me and find someone who isn't cursed. I'm not leaving you, said Sarah, but I want you to do one thing for me. Anything, said Elia. Sarah smiled. Sing me the pig lullaby. He sang it for her. Her eyes sparkled. That's so pretty. What, what does it mean? He, Elia tried his best to translate it from Latvian to English, but it, it wasn't the same. It rhymes in Latvian, he told her. I could tell, said Sarah. A year later, their child was born. Sarah named him Stanley because she noticed that Stanley was Yelnats spelled backwards. Sarah changed the words of the pig lullaby so that they rhymed. And every night she sang it to little Stanley. Now, at this point, I'd like you to kind of think about who Elia could be in the story, as well as think about this tune and where you may have heard it before. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was as soft as the skies, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, crying to the moon. If only, if only. Think back to where you've heard that before. Stanley's hole was as deep as his shovel, but not quite white enough on the bottom. He grimaced and sliced off a chunk of dirt, then raised it up and flung it into a pile. He laid his shovel back down on the bottom of his hole, and to his surprise, it fit. He rotated it, rotated it and only had to chip off a few chunks of dirt here and there before it could lie flat across his hole in every direction. He heard the water truck approaching and felt a strange sense of pride at being able to show Mr. Sir or Mr. Pandansky that he had dug his first hole. He put his hands on the rim and tried to pull himself up. He couldn't do it. His arms were too weak to lift his heavy body. He used his legs to help, but he didn't have any strength. He was trapped in his hole. He was almost funny, but he wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stanley, he heard Mr. Pandansky call. Using his shovel, he dug two footholes in the whole wall. He climbed out to see Mr. Pandansky walking over to him. I was afraid you fainted, Mr. Pandansky said. You wouldn't have been the first. I finished, Stanley said, putting his blood-spotted cap back on his head. All right, said Mr. Pandansky, raising his hand for a high five, but Stanley ignored him. He didn't have the strength. Mr. Pandansky lowered his hand, looked at Stanley's hole. Well done, he said. You want to ride back? Stanley shook his head. Uh, I'll walk. Mr. Pandansky climbed back on the truck without filling Stanley's canteen. Stanley waited for him to drive away and then took another look at his hole. He knew it was nothing to be proud of, but he felt proud nonetheless. He sucked up his last bit of saliva and spat. Chapter eight. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow spotted lizards, lizards either. But if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe in it or not. Actually, it is kind of odd that scientists name the lizard after its yellow spots. 
Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots, but the spots are hard to see on its yellow green body. The lizard is from six to 10 inches long and has big red eyes. In truth, its eyes are yellow and its skin around the eyes, which is red, but everyone always speaks of its red eyes. It also has black teeth and a milky white tongue. You might remember this reference earlier when they talked about the lizards in the desert and why it would be impossible to leave. Looking at one, you would have thought it should have been named a red-eyed lizard or a black tooth lizard or perhaps a white tongue lizard. If you've ever been close enough to see the yellow spots, then you're probably good. The yellow spotted lizards like to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in one hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of the very deep holes to attack their prey. So a predator attacks, the prey is the animal that they are going to attack. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and the shells of sunflower seeds. Think about who likes to eat those. Stanley stood in the shower and let the cold water pour over his hot and sore body. It was four minutes of heaven. For the second day in a row, he didn't use soap. He was too tired. There was no roof over the shower building and the walls were raised up six inches off the ground, except in the corners. There was no drain on the floor. The water ran out under the walls and evaporated quickly into the sun. Now evaporation means it's going to evaporate and turn into uh, water vapor what, quite quickly, almost like steam um, when it's a hot day and it um, hits something. Or if you are in a frying pan and water hits it, it kind of evaporates quickly into water vapor. He put on his clean set of orange clothes. He returned to his tent and put his, uh, his duty clothes back in this crate, got out his pen and a box of stationery and held, headed to the rec room. A sign on the door said rec room. Nearly everything in the room was broken. The TV, the pinball machine, the furniture, even the people looked broken with their worn out bodies sprawled all over various chairs and sofas. X-ray and armpit were playing pool. The surface of the table reminded Stanley of the surface of the lake. It was full of bumps and holes because so many people had carved their initials into the felt. There was a hole in the far wall and an electric fan had been placed in front of it. Cheap air conditioning, at least the fan worked. As Stanley made his way across the room, he tripped over an outstretched leg. Hey, watch it, said an orange lump on a chair. You watch it, muttered Stanley, too tired to care. What'd you say? The lump demanded. Nothing, said Stanley. The lump rose. He was almost as big as Stanley and a lot tougher. You said something. He poked his fat finger into Stanley's neck. What'd you say? A crowd quickly formed around them. Be cool, said X-Ray. He put his hand on Stanley's shoulder. You don't want to mess with caveman, he warned. I'm not looking for trouble, Stanley said. I'm just tired, that's all. The lump grunted. X-ray and armpit led Stanley over to a couch and Squid slid over to make room as Sam Stanley sat down. Did you see the caveman back there? X-ray asked. Caveman's one tough dude, said Squid, and he lightly punched Stanley's arm. Stanley leaned back against the torn vinyl upholstery. Despite his shower, his body still radiated heat. It wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to start anything, he said. The last thing he wanted to do after killing himself all day on the lake was get into a fight with the boy called the caveman. He was glad X-ray and armpit had come to his rescue. Well, how'd you like your first hole? Asked Squid. Stanley groaned and the other boys laughed. Well, first hole's the hardest, said Stanley. No way, said X-ray. The second hole's a lot harder. You're hurting before you even get started. If you think you're sore now, just wait and see how you feel tomorrow morning, right? That's right, said Squid. Plus, the fun's gone, said X-Ray. The fun? asked Stanley. Don't lie to me, said X-Ray. I bet you always wanted to dig a big hole, right? Am I right? Stanley had never thought about it before, but he knew better than to tell X-Ray he wasn't right. Every kid in the world wants to dig a great big hole, said X-Ray. To China, right? Right, said Stanley. See what I mean, said X-Ray? That's what I'm saying. But now the fun's gone and you still gotta do it again and again and again. 
Can't fun and games, said Stanley. What's in the box, asked Squid. Stanley had forgotten he had brought it. Oh, a uh, paper. I was going to write a letter to my mother. Your mother, laughed Squid. She'll worry if, if I don't. Squid, uh, Squid scowled. Stanley looked around the room. This was one, the one place in camp where the boys could enjoy themselves. And what did they do? They had wrecked it. The glass on the TV was smashed as if someone had put his foot through it. And every table and chair seemed to be missing at least one leg. Everything leaned. He waited to write the letter until after Squid had gotten up and joined the game of pool. Dear Mom, today was my first day at camp, and I've already made some friends. We've been out on the lake all day, so I'm pretty tired. Once I pass the swimming test, I'll get to learn how to water ski. I. He stopped writing as he became aware that someone was re somebody was reading over his shoulder. He turned to see Zero standing behind the couch. I, I don't want her to worry about me, he explains as to why he's saying another idea of what camp would sound like, not what he's going through. Zero said nothing. He just stared at the letter with a serious, almost angry look on his face. Stanley slipped it back into the stationary box. Did the shoes have red X's on the back? Zero asked him. It took Stanley a moment, but then he realized that Zero was asking about Clyde Livingston's shoes. Um, yes, they did, he, he said. He wondered how Zero knew that. Brand X was a popular brand of sneakers. Maybe Clyde Livingston made a commercial for them. Zero stared at him for a moment with the same intensity with which he had been staring at the letter. Stanley poked his finger through a hole in the vinyl couch and pulled out some of the stuffing. He wasn't aware of what he was doing. Come on, caveman, dinner, said Armpit. You coming, caveman, said Squid. Stanley looked around to see that Armpit and Squid were talking to him. Oh, sure, he said. He put the piece of stationery back in the box and then got up and followed the boys to the tables. The lump wasn't the caveman. He was. He shrugged, he shrugged his left shoulder. It was better than being barf bad. Get it? So he has a nickname. Chapter 10. Stanley had no trouble falling asleep, but morning came much too quickly. Every muscle and joint in his body ached as, if he, as he tried to get out of bed. He didn't think it was possible, but his body hurt more than it had the day before. It wasn't just his arms and back, but his legs, ankles, and waist also hurt. The only thing that got him out of bed was knowing that every second he wasted meant he was one second closer to the rising of the sun. He hated the sun. He could hardly lift his spoon during breakfast, and when he was out on the lake, his spoon was replaced by a shovel. He found a crack on the ground and began his second hole. He stepped on the shovel blade and pushed on the very back of the shaft with the base of his thumb. This hurt less than trying to hold the shaft with his blistered fingers. And as he dug, he was careful to dump the dirt far away from the hole. He needed to save the area for the hole or when his hole was much deeper. He didn't know if he'd ever get that far. X-ray was right. The second hole was the hardest. It would take a miracle. As long as the sun wasn't out yet, he removed his cap and used it to help protect his hands. Once the sun rose, he would have to put it back on his head. His neck and forehead had been badly burned the day before. He took it one shovelful at a time and tried not to think of the awesome task that lay ahead of him. After an hour or so, his sore muscles seemed to loosen up a bit. He grunted as he tried to stick his shovel into the dirt. His cap slipped from under his fingers and the shovel fell free. He let it lie there. He took a drink from his canteen. He guessed that the water truck should be coming soon, but he didn't finish all the water just in case he was wrong. He'd learned to wait until he saw the truck before drinking the last drop. The sun wasn't up yet, but its rays arced over the horizon and brought light to the sky. He reached down to pick up his cap and there next to it, he saw a flat, a wide flat rock. As he put his cap on his head, he continued to look down at the rock. He picked it up. He thought he could see the shape of a fish fossilized in it. He rubbed off some dirt and the outline of the fish became clearer. The sun peaked over the horizon and he could actually see tiny lines where every one of the fish's bones had been. He looked at the barren land all around them. Barren's a great word too. 
So when there's not much around there, it's not going to produce anything. It's pretty lifeless. True, everyone had referred to this area as the lake, but it was still hard to believe that this dry wasteland was once full of water. Then he remembered what Mr. Sir and Mr. Pandansky had both said. If he dug up anything interesting, he should report it to one of them. If the warden liked it, he would get the rest of the day off. He looked down at the fish. He had found his miracle. He continued to dig, though very slowly, as he waited for the water truck. He didn't want to bring attention to his spine, afraid that one of the other boys might try and take it from him. He tossed the rock face down besides his dirt pile as if it had no special value. A short while later, he saw the cloud of dirt heading across the lake. A truck stopped and the boys lined up. And they always lined up in the same order. Stanley realized no matter who got there first, X-ray was always at the front of the line. Then came armpit, squid, zigzag, magnet, and zero. Stanley got in line behind zero. He was glad to be at the back so no one would notice the fossil. His pants had very large pockets, but the rock still made a bulge. Mr. Pandansky filled each boy's canteen until Stanley was the only one left. I found something, Stanley said, taking it out of his pocket. Mr. Pandansky reached for Stanley's canteen, but Stanley handed him the rock instead. What's this? It's a fossil, said Stanley. See, the fish. Mr. Pandansky looked at it again. See, you can even see all of its little bones, said Stanley. Interesting, said Mr. Pandansky. Let me have your canteen. Stanley handed it to him. Mr. Pandansky filled it and then returned it. So do I get the rest of the day off? What for? You know, you said if I found something interesting, the warden would give me the day off. Mr. Pandansky laughed as he gave the fossil back to Stanley. Sorry, Stanley, the warden is interested in fossils. Let me see that, said Magnet, taking the rock from Stanley. Stanley continued to stare at Mr. Pandansky. Hey, Zig, dig this rock. Cool, said Zigzag. Stanley saw his fossil being passed around. I don't see nothing, said X-Ray. He took off his glasses, wiped them, wiped them on his dirty clothes, and put them right back on. See, look at the little fishy, said Armpit. Thanks for listening, boys and girls. That was chapters six through 10. See you soon.